and that's why we eventually came up with these neural network models that are less obsessed about individual occurrences and more about averaging and aggregating into a more compact vector form. So the, there's an, quite an early approach by Joshua Bengjo, 2003, that one did not get that much attention back then. The attention to this work came much later. It didn't hit the media that much. Still, the ideas are, pre are already in there. You want to learn a feature vector in some vector space r to the power of d that literally vectors represent word similarity. And for this, we need a lookup table that maps words to vectors. And then we can get the context by concatenating the neighbor words. In this case, it's preceding words, so one-sided context. Later on, we often use two-sided contexts. And that's kind of what, in the feature functors, we have been also looking at previous and next words. And then we need a um, connection layer that maps these and uh, aggregates these, and a hidden layer in the neural network with a sigmoid activation, tangent hyperbolicus, and uh, then the hidden layer to the output matrix, and we need a bias and all of that. And we will eventually get a typical shallow neural network. So it's input uh, times uh, the neighbors times the W and the words times X and combining this. And then to predict, we're going to use a softmax, also the standard technique for choosing a discrete output. So the softmax emphasizes the largest value, and if the largest one is much larger than the remainder, then we eventually get a one in one cell, and the others are close to zero, and that's the, the one that we are going to predict. And we're trying to predict words, so we want extreme predictions. Either it is a word that we predict or it's not. That's all done by the softmax. The softmax is adding this exponential and then normalizing it to one. So that maxim that ex amplifies large values and amplifies the largest value. So we're going to predict the next word giving the C previous words by a standard neural network model. That didn't quite ca ca catch on yet, probably because of the experiment. I don't know if it was actually working bad, but it didn't quite catch on. 10 years later, that's when it, these things really kicked off with the word to vec approach. Not just because of very fancy uh, news articles on this. And I think it was at, at Google, uh, he moved on to Facebook later on, but I think at this time, Mikolov was at Google. And everything Google gets more attention. The idea of continuous bag of words is kind of similar. We have the neighbor words, and we encode them as binary vectors. That is the lookup table, essentially, what we are, lookup table invocation, let's put it this way, that we are doing. And we are not going to compute it as a matrix multiplication. We are going to look it, you know, implement this as a lookup table. But formally, it is a matrix multiplication. Every value that we get from the data, from the lookup, is multiplied with one, and it's one hot vector. So these one hot vectors are the neighbor words. And we multiply this with our weight matrix. So we look up the corresponding rows. One times uh, gives us exactly one of these rows in this matrix. So we get some of these rows. Well, I should indicate them as the ones that are green. And add them. That is what is happening here. We've been adding the unit vectors, multiplying that with the matrix is the same as taking the rows and adding them. That will give us an interim fe feature representation in here. 
And then we are multiplying this again with an output matrix and doing a softmax to identify which is the most likely prediction for the missing word. So for the context words, the neighbor words, we're going to predict the central word. We tend to get a dense vector in here because these rows are dense. And we can train this using standard gradient descent me method. This is a shallow neural network, so we don't need much special training techniques, but standard backpropagation will be fine. For a single hidden uh, layer, we don't have any problems with this. We can put in the boy in here as a one. That should be predicted. A vector that has one in the position corresponding to boy, and we can put the chase playground, and these words as input on the left-hand side, gradient descent. By doing the gradient descent, we optimize our weight matrices in here. And these weight matrices are called embeddings. Now in this case, every word has two embeddings. One that is coming from the left, that is the kind of query embedding, the context, and one that is coming from the right, like the output embedding. In many cases, one or the other is only used. In other cases, they are averaged or whatever. Nevertheless, these, these live in the, the same domain because we multiply them together and find the one that has the largest product. So they are not independent. The, the, so that is the, let's say, the obvious idea. Predicting the missing word from the context. That's the motivation that we had. It turns out that it didn't work that well initially. When we began working on this, a method called skipgram with negative sampling, or SGNS, worked better. And that is the same thing the other way around. So we are putting in the missing word boy. And instead of predicting the missing word, we are predicting the context. So we're predicting boy co occurs with playground chase is on and all of this. But we removed stop words. So it would probably be the dog and dog chase playground that we're trying to predict. And that worked better. I don't have a reference in here, but it, I think I read a paper that it was actually of an implementation error. And if you fix that error, then they both work similarly well. It just took 10 years to discover this. No, not yet 10 years. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't understand that yet. Uh, is the order of the words important here? How they come in, in the matrix there? Or? No, the order is actually ignored here. The only thing, part of the order that is used is by the window. So you only take the preceding five and next five words, for example. Um, you will probably get a two in there at that point because um, you add them. And on the right-hand side, you wouldn't need to predict multiple ones then. Yeah. So I don't know if they would put in uh, two in, this, um, in the output in this case. Yeah. Now, what they do need for the skip with negative sampling is you also need to put in like, uh, and, like punish false predictions. So if it predicts the neighbor word of boy is Obama, then that is uh, wrong. And to train this, you on, not only need to train on the correct words, but you also need to train on the false words. But there are many, many more false words. And taking all of them is too expensive. So you sample the negatives. And I think it's 
take as many negative examples that were not in the neighbors as you took positive ones to kind of balance them. Yeah, so um, yeah, and they used usually a context window of five to both sides. And I think stop words were removed that re improved quality also for, the, for this neural network model. And um, it does not work on rare words. You have too few samples to do a, a good gradient uh, descent here and the feature vector will quite likely overfit. There's not much in here that prevents the vectors to, to overfit, except that you want to make them small enough. You would usually choose like a 300 dimensional vector in the middle. So for every word in your corpus, you would need to store a 300 dimensional vector, meaning that these matrices are pretty big. But despite all the hype on GPUs and all of this, at this level, we don't use GPUs. This was C code running on the CPU. Because this multiplication is a table lookup. And on this side, we are also doing a table lookup. So the only multiplication in there is between two vectors. For each one, we have two vectors that we multiply together. There's little benefit of transferring that to a GPU and back. Okay, 